one civil rights case I had, which is a, a heartbreaker. We had a, during particularly violent times in Atlanta, when the, there were riots and fire bombings and that sort of thing, the, a curfew was put on a black area in Atlanta and uh, a kid, and this will this will trigger your thought about what happened in in uh, where was it? This Trayvon case. Oh yeah. Uh, in Florida. Yeah, Florida. A kid was shot. He was shot by police through the heart in his back. Old boy got. Uh, uh, 15 years old, I think it was. He was running for home. He got caught out during curfew when he wasn't supposed to be out on the street, and he was running for home. His name was Andre Moore. Uh, that's been a long time ago, but I'll never forget this case. I got assigned the civil rights case for killing him. And you know, whatever. And uh, as a result of that violence that occurred that night, and for the few other nights, and the killing of the boy, there was tremendous violence in that whole community. There were burnings, uh, shootings all kinds of violent stuff. But I got assigned the civil rights case for the uh, killing of, of the boys by police officers. Uh, the instructions the instructions were that we should only go into that area if there were two of us and that we were armed and uh, I forget what else. That was probably it. But definitely two of us completely armed. Well, I got to surveying this situation. I said, that ain't going to work. I said, the only thing that's going to work with this place down here, this area down here is go in as a non-combatant. Mm. So I drove the car down there, parked about three blocks away from it, took off my suit coat, had no gun on, and all I was carrying was a briefcase. And I said, I, it's, it'll make sense to show these people that you're not out here to harass them or to create problems, more problems than they've already got. So I walked that three blocks from where the car was parked, which was kind of chancy in itself. I'm surprised it didn't get beat up. I walked to their house and everybody that I passed on the street was giving me dirty looks and turning and looking at me and mumbling stuff. And they were not happy people at all. And you were alone? I was alone. And I went to the mother's house. It was the mother, the victim boy, and his sister, older sister. I went and interviewed him. That was one of the first interviews to find out exactly how everything transpired, how it went down. Well, it turned out that with the boy was running away from the police. He had been out on the street and I pretty well established that he snuck out of the house and went down on the street and bought a slushy from a vendor on the street. So he's probably holding a slushy in his hand. The cop said he had a gun in his hand, which wasn't true. Anyway, the uh, when he got home, 
He'd been shot in the back and he fell into his sister's arms. Dead. And so I went in the house and his poor little mother in just a dirty shack just like you find in the slums at that time. She was just, you know, it, it just it, terrible the way the grief that she was showing. So I grabbed her and put my arms around her and pulled her up close to me and hugged her for a long time. And I said, I'm sorry, I know, I know what you're going through. And uh, we talked for a while. I got enough information out of her that she could tell me the details of what happened. And the sister who greeted me with hatred, because I was the bad honky, mm -hmm. I reached out and grabbed her too. And both of them just boo-hooed on my shoulder. Mm -hmm. hmm. So we finished that up and walk, started walking back to the car, the three blocks back. And... Uh, Boy, what a difference in the attitude of people on the street after that. They'd pass me by and some of them would nod, say hello. Boy, news traveled fast. Yeah, then, just... yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it beats any telegraph system. You get in a ghetto, forget your telephones. They know what's going on. And they were friendly. Well, I, yeah. they were satisfied that I wasn't there to do a job on them. As it finally turned out, those two cops resigned from the police department and immediately enlisted in the army. So they weren't prosecuted. Mm. Which was a little questionable, but that's that's up to the Justice Department to de determine how that's going to be handled. So from the information you gathered, that's why you say a little questionable because it seemed to you that they did use poor judgment. Oh yeah, they were, they were, they were dead wrong. Yeah. yeah. And that's about the only, I think it's the only civil rights case I ever had that I thought the cops were absolutely wrong. There was no cause. No cause at all. No cause, to, no reason to chase a kid down the street when he's running away from you, take aim and shoot him in the back. There's no, you couldn't find an excuse for that. It's interesting that you decided on a completely different mode of approaching. Well, I was, <laughs> thing is, I was violating what the Bureau said to do. Yeah. <laughs> I, say, and I thought to myself, that ain't going to work. Because we could have, if the two of us had gone down there armed, Look, looking for trouble. We'd have had all the trouble we could handle. You sure absorbed a so lot of So you have to use a little, little psychology Street sometimes. Street smarts. Yeah. So you, you have had absorbed a lot about human behavior. Yeah. Even without taking, being a psychology yeah. major. Yeah. Which I suppose you learned a, a lot of things about human behavior. Yeah, yeah. That you wouldn't have in a in a different situation. Yeah, when I I finished the investigation, it took another couple of days interviewing witnesses and so forth. Uh, then I had a short time frame to get my report typed up and mailed off, and. Uh, Bless her heart, I had a steno who would agreed to stay at work after working hours on a Friday night and take my dictation, which was pretty extensive and detailed. And uh, she uh, she did it and. Uh, I can say that was Friday, and that weekend her child died 
of Sid's sudden The Stenos? Yeah. Yeah. Just when Sid's was not very understood. Yeah, I didn't even hear of it at that time, really, I guess. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't remember what year that was. It was yeah, but it's interesting that you about remember. About 1970 or something like that. You remember the detail of coming back and dictating to her and it yeah. was Friday, and, yeah. but no, was you had that. She was a great gal. She was like a, she was like an agent herself. She was so loyal. Well, I guess the people in the office uh, pretty much knew everything that was going on. Yeah, they pretty much. Uh -huh. So they were part of the team. Yeah.